Namaste. We are a team of three co-authors. My name is Shruti Sharma, and I go to School of Science and Engineering at Town Magnet. My name is Aditya Sharkar. I'm an 11th grader at James Martin High School in Arlington, Texas. My name is Vienna Dutto, and I go to LD Bell High School, and I'm 11th grader at Hearst, Texas. Our talk will be based on our Waves 2024 paper titled, Top Allegorical Tales in Vedic Literature that Relay an Important Point. Thanks for giving us your valuable time at this Waves 2024 conference. Our goal is to identify some key allegorical messages from Vedic literature and see if we can understand their meaning. Are they all silly tales that fit in the category of myth with no purpose other than a wild imagination by someone? Or do, they, or do they have deep purpose and relay some important message? Full disclosure, we will use the interpretation made by many researchers before us, since we're not Sanskrit scholars ourselves. We will try to look for patterns and figure out why the Vedas use symbolism, anthropomorphism, algorithm, and etc. as means of communication. Scholars have pointed out that transliteration of Vedas often miss the mark by a mile. Very often, transliteration is done by those who are non-practitioners and are outside the religion. They use the crudest meanings and often miss even the most basic understanding of the verse. The translation may sometimes be accurate, but, na- but may not convey the meaning of the verse intended to convey. Those who do not get stuck at the stage of the literal translation may get a few levels of the meaning of the verse. Adi Bhaktik, which is the outside layer similar to the body. The Adi Davik, layer similar to the cognates within the mind. Or the deepest layer, Adatmik layer. The language of the Vedas in general is highly metaphorical, full of double ends, many meanings, allegories, riddles, puns, etc. Rene found a lot more than three meanings in the Vedic literature. The Satvata Brahmana, a commentary on the Sukla Yajuri Veda, says Paroksha Priyava Deva Pratyaksa Devsa, meaning the Devi Devdas like to be cryptid, veiled, and do not like to easily unveil themselves. They dislike to say what is obvious. Sri Aurobindo has explained the purpose behind this. He says that the creation cycle involved many billions of years, when the supreme reality broke off a piece and came out the Prakriti. The Prakriti took eons to lose its awareness of its identity, while still containing the divine within it. He called this process involution. After the involution is complete, the process evolution then starts. This process again takes many billions of years. Prakriti solely gains its awareness of its true self, and through constant removal of layers of maya, one at a time, gets back to the stage of full awareness of its true identity. In human time, if this process takes billions of years, don't you agree that it would not be fun to make it easy and provide obvious messages in the Vedas? Hence the cryptology, maybe? We will now start looking at the allegorical tales themselves that we chose to point out. Not one, but ten avatars. The first tale we will be looking at is the story of the Dutch avatars of Vishnu. The story shows a study and basis of evolution where this was formally established by Charles Darwin. An idea in Hindu ideology and culture is shown through symbols and meaningful stories. The idea can reflect how the Dutch avatar and story ideology is portrayed. The idea of evolution is shown through Dutch avatar, where precisely there is 10 different forms of the avatar. The 10 being the fish, the tortoise, the boar, the man lion, the dwarf, the Barsarma, Rama, Krishna, Balarama, and Galki. Through the 10 avatars, you are able to see the progression of human nature and life, and within the Dutch avatar, it shows how evolution also creates change of the mind and the evolution consciousness. This can reflect that evolution simply only goes up and advances, where we go back and forth in our consciousness, which can be called moksha. Turn away. The next allegorical tale we have next is the Samramanta, also known as the turning of the ocean, where the divine, the devas, and the demons, and suryas, unite together to move or turn the ocean of milk, due to needing nectar of Amrita or immortality for their own power. Through this journey, Lord Indra, the Lord of um, Heaven, meets sage Durvas. This interaction between the two creates services to offer a gift to Indra as a way to show honor and respect towards Indra. Hindu culture show, uh, shows hospitality and good gesture. This gift was a garland. Indra placed this delicate garland on her elephant tusk, Arvitya. This elephant ends up throwing the garland on the ground, creating a sense of self-respect within Sage Dervisa, thus leading him to be enraged. This enragement creates Dervisa to curse all the gods and devas to lose their power. This creates the power to be dominant within the demons or the Asuryas, makeshifting a disruption in the balance of power. The story makes a very important point that to get to the truth, which is essence of it all, Similar to a small pot of nectar after filtering through the vast oceans, one has to work very hard. It is not easy to find the truth or achieve moksha or find the 
universal reality and become one with it without a lot of training. This can take millions of births. Too hot in the kitchen? Coronal mass ejections, or CME, are basically the solar flares that cause isotopes to make it to Earth's ionosphere. They cause the northern lights, and the magnetic fields direct them towards the polar regions of the Earth. Most solar storms are minor, and other than the northern lights types of shows, they don't affect us much. There are a few recorded flames that were pretty significant. A very large one came through in the past few hundred years. But a massive one is recorded in Vedic history, which caused the atmospheric particles to get a large charge and caused heat and some fires around the Earth. The Vedas refer to this event in a form of an allegorical tale. The sun's anthropomorphic wife, Samjana, gets tired of his heat and goes all the way to the South Pole. The sun follows her. The astronomical marker in the Vedic story puts the sun at the trophic of Capricorn and also notes that the helical rising of the sun was at the point at the head of Aries, also known as the Ashvins. Plugging this into the astronomical computers gave historians like Vedam a date approximately close to 7200 BCE. Moon has how many wives? This moon takes 27 days to travel through the 27 nakshatras. So in that sense, he gave equal attention to his 27 wives. But the 26 sisters complained to their all-powerful father, King Daksha, that the moon favored the one sister, Rohani. More than any of them, 26 sisters and the poor moon got punished by having to wax and wane. The moon phases take 29.5 days total. Turns out they were referring to the lunar oculation, which is a process of one celestial body hiding the other by coming in front of it and us, the observers of Earth. A star will go through the lunar oculation if it lies within four to six degrees on the lunar orbit. The only star out of the 27 that falls within four to six degrees of the lunar orbit is Rohini, which happens to lie exactly five degrees off the lunar orbit. Oh, the calendar is a mess. It is well known that on a given calendar day, the star position changed constantly, a bit very slowly. Over a long enough period of time, the nystectras that were visible during certain events were very different from those a few thousand years ago. Due to precession, the nystectra system moves forward around one Rakshi every 2,100 years approximately. In 6,000 BCE, ancient Indians got very disoriented since the astronomical markers that they had established some thousand years ago had completely changed due to precession and they wanted to get back to some order and have better markers. So the Tia Prasuna Nisectra offered for all rituals as in the new year to start with her, as in she, as in when she was in the vernal equinox. This must have eliminated the confusion for at least another 2,100 years, and there were possibly many more resets since then. From Rishi to Star, Rishi Agatsya is famed from coming from north of India and then settling down to the southern parts of India. Coincidentally, Canopus, a star, is called Agatsya in Sanskrit. Our tale takes him from the start of Kurukruk Chetra towards southern India, crossing the Vindeyas Mountains, having an ashram possibly in present-day Nasik, where Sri Ram met him, and then going to Chidam Ram, and then disappearing to the ocean. The story probably refers to the tall growth in the mountains, which may have harbored Rashahas that was bothering the rishis living near the mountain. Agatsya asks Vindeha not to grow until he comes back from his journey towards the south. He is known to have been visible from Chidambram and then goes away from the past horizon as viewed from the southern tip of India, but was visible from the mountaintop. This allegorical story that really talks about a star but uses Agatsya's Rishi's name actually is an astronomical marker of significance. It is easily calculable using the astronomical software that the last time Canopus was visible from the Vindeya mountain range in India, going in the southern direction, was in 19,000 BCE. Help, no eligible suitor? This allegorical tale found in Vedic literature explained the concept of time dilation. King Kukudami couldn't find any suitor for his daughter, Rivati. He travels in Brahmlok, pops a very distant star with very high gravity, possibly via my travel, to ask Prama the Creator to help point to a suitable match in its creation. He had to wait on Brahma for a few minutes. When Brahma hears his request, he bursts out laughing and explains that two minutes that he had to wait, many yugas and millions of years have passed on earth, and none of his kingdom or descendants are around anymore. Brahma suggests that when he gets back, it would be a new yuga, and Balarama, the avatar, Shishnag, would be a deserving match. When King Kukudami gets back to earth, he discovers another interesting force of nature, that Rivati is way bigger than Balrama, thus illustrating an important reality that all creatures millions of years ago were very large compared, compared to today's creatures. 
this story is set in South Yuga, an important point to note is that per the charts available today in 2000 BC, the total world population was only 2 million. The Eight Couple. This story is about an ideal couple, Mahavrashmashadni and his chast and his previous wife, Pradhani. Agni was able to feel fool the six sisters out of the seven sisters, pointing to the seven stars of the Big Dipper or Shatrashi Mahavrashmashadni. To be all, uh, known to all by chast and loyal, was locked in a binary pair with her husband, Vashasani, and both are known to be loyal to each other and being the ideal couple. Ancient Indians were able to see with their naked eye that the two binary stars took turns rotating around, aka falling around each other. This is why after a Hindu wedding, the just married couple goes and bows down in the direction of Rudhani and Vashasana because they signify an ideally married couple who are loyal to each other and serve each other by taking turns revolving around each other. Oh my, the universe is huge. There are mentions of multiple universes in Vedic literature. Brunas mentioned a story of Sri Krishna mentioning to Brahma that he's just one of many Brahmas. Now, Brahma is associated with the creation of the universe. Multiple Brahmas here in this story implies multiple universes. Vedas also constantly mention creation and destruction of universes, and that this process occurs in an infinite cycle. To trace the awareness of multiverse in the West, Boltzmann and Zermelo in 1895 first discussed this concept, and Irvin Schrodinger proposed this in Dublin in 1952. These and other known allegorical tales in the Vedas convey an important point. They come to us a direct communication from the Maharishis who composed the Vedas, who were super scientists of ancient India. They were, what, they were the ones who supervised a lot of scientific and mathematical research in their ashrams. Not only were they adept in physical science, most of them were accomplished masters in metaphysical and spiritual aspects of life. The known tales, but they're a tip of the iceberg. The Vedas and Hunas are full of such agricultural tales that are locked up in them, and humanity is fast losing the ability to keep a deep dive and bring them out. We don't even know enough to know how useful such valuable scientific, physiological, medical information is buried in the sum total of books commonly referred to as Vedic literature. Hope humanity invests in the study of the Vedas to understand the deep knowledge that the Maharishis left for us in a coded, often hard-to-recognize language. Thank you so much for listening. Namaste. Namaste. Namaste.